so pumped to be on this together, guys. Um, That's right. And, uh, yeah, this is fun. This is a this is a good squad here to talk about uh, activated church and activated believers and uh, what it looks like to take action. So we're gonna jump in, and uh, I'm gonna introduce these guys, and then we will. I'm just gonna throw some questions out, and uh, we'll go from there. It's gonna be a ton of fun. We'll just see how long we go, but. Um, before I even throw some questions out and introduce you guys, I'd just love to hear even any kind of testimonies, anything that's kind of going on epic in your guys' lives right now. And then we'll jump into our topic of discussion. But uh, um, so many of you guys would know the guys on here, depending on where you're from, your background. But uh, I'll start with Jimmy. This is Jimmy Seibert, who is uh, an incredible man, incredible friend. And uh, I, when my first inter- one of my first introductions to Jimmy was actually through Francis. And uh, Francis told me that one of one of the churches and one of the pastors that he most trusted in the whole nation in America was Jimmy, and that he did he knew of very few churches that were having such an impact on both a local and a global level as um, Jimmy. And I had heard of Jimmy before that, but we had never really met or spent time together. And so on Francis's recommendation, of course, I was very excited to meet Jimmy, and everything Francis said was true. And, uh, and Jimmy has pioneered uh, Antioch in Waco, Texas. Since then, Antioch has spread around the world, around America, um, the church planning movement across America, as well as in, uh, I have had the privilege of working with Antioch teams in nations all over the world. And uh, they have joyfully sent teams to some of the more difficult places in the world to uh, start people movements, disciple making movements, church planning movements. And honestly, they are just doing incredible stuff all over the world. And uh, Jimmy and Antioch also have a massive belief in young people and in championing young people. And I think that has been such a big part of the movement. Um, So Jimmy is amazing. We spent time together in Texas and Myanmar um, and Kona. And uh, we uh, we have quite a rivalry going on with Jimmy and Francis <laughs> and myself and a few others. Teo, we should invite you into this. It's an ongoing. It's it's just a it's just a pure competition. Whenever we're yeah. together, we compete at something, whether it's bowling or three on three basketball or anything, anything to compete at. And whoever loses has to have this trophy which jimmy do you have the trophy no way Francis yeah has the trophy, man. i have it but you're supposed to have it that's oh, right. right that's right yeah, yeah. he's lost bowling in, that... in myanmar 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 no <laughs> after myanmar you lost something no he lost stupid he... shuffleboard game oh. <laughs> I, I i think he's I got you jimmy hand. i mean uh, i serious? you <laughs> I think, Jimmy, I think he's got you. You did. You lost so bad at shuffleboard in Myanmar. Fair, hey, I, fair enough. So bad. Hard, hard it to was, go low, but I, I will yeah. for this moment. Yes, it was so bad, if I remember right. So we got to make sure that. <laughs> Listen <laughs> to you. If we took the scores, Andy, bro, you're a great missionary, and you look good, but I would just not. I think the total <laughs> scores is you're coming in. Uh, Francis, I, give me a little help. Take it easy. I yeah, think, I, I mean, I <laughs> I did lose at golf. I lost at Top Golf bad. So yeah. I'll, I'll admit that. Top Golf, I was the worst Top Golf player on the team. I did have the trophy for a while. Francis had the trophy for a while, but clearly the the, the, uh, the hey. person who's meant to have the trophy is Jimmy right now. So for the moment. It's just a momentary <laughs> light affliction. <But> I'm looking <laughs> to get back together and let's go. Yeah, we need to. We need to compete again. So we will. Yeah. Unfortunately, I was with Francis over Easter. We competed at Frisbee Golf, and he obliterated me. But I wasn't officially part of the tournament, so it doesn't count. It doesn't that's count. because all he does is speak at conferences and then play uh, games. <laughs> I mean, this, is, that's oh. not- <laughs> this got good. This got good real kids. fast. I got to keep him at our <laughs> team. This, this is good. Love you, okay. man. Love yeah, you, Yeah, so that's Jimmy. I'm going to ask Jimmy some questions here. Next, I'm going to go to Teo Hayashi. Teo is one of my closest friends, and uh, he is a pastor and movement leader in Brazil. 
and uh, started a movement called Dunamis Movement on, on uh, campuses all across Brazil and other nations with full-time campus presence, like disciple movements, incredible stuff happening through Dunamis, nationwide gatherings. It's truly a youth movement that's rocking the nation. He was the catalyst to the send in Brazil and uh, where we saw God do remarkable things. And then also has a church that his mom planted that uh, Teo has taken leadership of and done, done a remarkable job. The church is growing. Uh, exponentially and is one of the most amazing communities I've seen of young professionals who have not separated their career from their kingdom lifestyle. So these are professionals who are praying for the sick in the marketplace. These are professionals who see their job unto the glory of God. And uh, Teo has just done an incredible job of leading an activated community, both in the university world, high schools, as well as in the local church. And so I'm excited to hear from Teo and uh, amazing part of the SEND collaboration as well. And then Francis Chan is probably the one that most of you don't know and uh, <laughs> have heard. <laughs> He's the, the new kid on the block. But uh, <laughs> Francis, uh, Francis is one of my heroes and has become one of my close, close friends. And uh, Francis uh, is an is amazing uh, church, has started an incredible church in Simi Valley, California. Remarkable fruit from that church and went on an incredible journey to understand more effectively how could he mobilize people into the Great Commission and how could he activate believers to actually reach the lost, share the gospel, make disciples. That journey led him to something I'm going to ask him about, but actually to China where his kind of whole world was turned upside down in terms of the model of church that he felt to multiply. And so the We Are Church movement birthed out of that. And uh, he has spent uh, time in America planting churches in San Francisco, helping other church planting networks in Hong Kong for the last year, which I want to hear more about as well. And, um, and, and then also, of course, has written lots of books that have rocked lots of our lives. Crazy Love being one of the, the first that so many lives were impacted by, but most recently has written a book on unity. I don't know if, uh, Jimmy, have you had a chance to read the unity no. book yet? I haven't seen it yet. So I, I, uh, Francis, I think he likes me a little bit more than you, Jimmy. So he exactly. sent me the, uh, yeah, yeah. He hey, sent me the, the, the pre-publisher version. A thought there, Andy, but I'll <laughs> Sorry, I need to read the book again, but he, uh, this book on unity, I read it uh, right before it came out, just came out. And honestly, I would say to everybody that's listening, please get this book. It is a prophetic word to the body of Christ. Uh, globally about the importance of unity right now. It is like, it is so potent, so clear, and so full of truth. So ju um, jump on Amazon, grab that book. I promise you it will challenge you, but also leads the conversation into biblical unity. It's so good. So guys, let's jump in. And I know I said we were going to start with testimonies, but um, for the sake of the time, let's let the testimonies unfold out of the stories. And Jimmy, I want to start with you. And Teo and Francis, jump in anytime you want to ask Jimmy something or interrupt him or correct him if he, you know, <laughs> says something that's not totally right. Um, <laughs> But Jimmy, um, I was stunned when I began to hear the stories about how um, you took a church, Antioch and Waco, and your team, and that went from kind of local church model to radically adopting the city and actually adopting a real specific region in the city right. and seeing real transformation, like trackable statistical traceable transformation and how that led to essentially adopting the entire city and really seeing i mean massive breakthrough in really difficult demographics statistics you know and seeing real change through the power of the gospel jimmy give us a little bit give us first question give us 60 90 seconds on sure. what was behind maybe the encounter with jesus the revelation of jesus what was behind that heart and that passion and then number two another you know couple minutes on how did you help move your people into that level of activation and influence across the city give us some thoughts on that yeah you know my my favorite scripture in the bible is acts 4 13 where it says they look on them as being untrained and uneducated men but having been with jesus 
I mean, literally, uh, the manifestation of Jesus is us loving him, worshiping him. And when we do that in community, people see Jesus in everything that we do. And so for us, because we had already had a heart uh, working around the world among the unengaged and unreached, we came back and we said, in Waco, Texas, we've got to do it locally if we're going to reproduce it anywhere in the world. We can't reproduce what we don't already own in our hearts and our lives. So we pulled a few people together and planted uh, Antioch Community Church. Uh, and we just said, all right, let's be Jesus where we live. And many of us lived here in a neighborhood, which was the number one crime district in our uh, city. Uh, and we just said, all right, nobody, uh, no programming. You're going to love your neighbor. You're going to live Jesus. We're going to do it house to house whatever is before you meet the need. And so that eventually led into helping people out of drug addiction and helping people with education and clinics and schools. But really one one thing happened during that time was we were broken into in our home. It's the only time it ever happened. And everything was uh, ransacked and stolen. And one of our guys from the neighborhood, a Hispanic guy that was just a dear friend that we'd helped get out of addiction and brokenness and everything else. He came to my house and he said, Hey, we, I, I heard you were broken into that. He said, I got everybody on the streets. We're looking for them. We're going to take them out. And I said, Juan, do not do that, man. That's not Jesus. I said, look, and he said, they don't mess with our pastor. They don't mess with uh, our people. You are family. And that is the bottom line. And so praise God, the police found him before Juan did. But here's the point. The point is when we live incarnationally, people become family. And when we do family locally, it reproduces anywhere in the world. But we got to own our home if we're going to reproduce the life of Jesus through the, uh, through the family of God anywhere in the world. We do it locally. We export it uh, 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 everywhere in the world. And, uh, and maybe just one last little thing, uh, just a quick little testimony. Just uh, last week. Uh, there was a, a black pastor in our community that was in our neighborhood. We were dear friends, and and uh, he'd taken in foster care kids as a part of their calling. And we had championed and prayed for these kids, and they were challenges. And then he moved off, and um, the kids definitely, uh, a couple of kids struggled. Long story short, they, the kid ended up back in our neighborhood at 22 years old. Our guys just led him to the Lord last week. He was going to get baptized. He got shot eight times, didn't hit any of his vital organs. He comes back the next week ready to get baptized, celebrating God's deliverance in his life. And uh, his his foster parents slash uh, old friends in their 70s sitting on the back row wailing, wailing at the uh, 15, 20 year culmination of taking this kid in, seeing him saved, seeing him delivered, seeing him baptized, and we had hundreds of students around him praying for the restoration of family and celebrating this kind of work that's been done over the last few years. Wow. So I just want to say the foster care thing is a challenge, but when you connect it rightly to community and you contend for the long haul, then everybody gets to celebrate and it begins a chain reaction of family being made. Wow. Wow. Well, Jimmy, Jimmy, let me ask one more thing in that is, um, how, you know, so, so, so the challenge for so many leaders, pastors is to move a congregation beyond, you know, coming on Sunday morning, having a great message and then, you know, living good, but busy and full lives to actually becoming the hands and feet of Jesus you know, and really impacting the community. What was the key? Like, what was the main thing for Antioch that made from the beginning even that the culture of the church was that if you joined our church, you are the hands and feet of Jesus in our community versus participants in, you know, in services? How did you make that transition? Yeah, you preach to the, to the disciples and you let the crowds watch. You're not reaching the crowds, man. You're you're wow. reaching the disciples with the That's radical good. message of Jesus, and you let the crowds watch. Let the crowds take care of themselves. Go for the heart. Live like Jesus. And as one business guy in our community that's very impactful in his own life and ministry, he said, I said, why do you do it, man? Why do you go for it in your workplace or house? He said, because you do. Wow. Pastor, friend, leader, if you don't live it, and we lived in the neighborhood, we loved our neighbors, we discipled them, we evangelized them, and they were now stories of a now life that we were able to introduce. Wow, that's so good, Jimmy. And Jimmy, just, just to understand the potential and the power of an activated community, 
Um, give us a couple examples of how things in Waco began to change. Even some of the, maybe some of the different statistics or some of the different yeah. neighborhoods. Just give us a couple examples. Well, our particular neighborhood here, we not we blocked uh, 450 homes, two schools, and it was the number one crime district in the city. It's number nine today. There were no businesses in the city. They're flourishing businesses. The school, we started a mentor program our reading to kids. They were last at the bottom of the list in the state and national levels. They are now next to the top, and they use that model of, of uh, kids learning to read at the at the third to fifth grade level. That's how they plan the prison system around kids reading levels because if they don't learn to read they don't graduate they don't graduate they're going to be in prison so they it used this process this modeling of mentoring that was created just out of discipleship and just out of what are the needs and how do we do it they use this modern mentoring, mentoring model now in most every school here in our inner city and um, and it's born great fruit and it's uh, statistically backed up it's not just anecdotal it's like, hey, this is solid evidence that if you mentor kids, read to them every week and care for them, it produces this outcome that then affects the prison system, that then affects the school district, and then you're able to multiply it. So that would be an example. Wow. And that yeah. was, uh, we encourage our people to go be teachers in the local school in our neighborhood, in our inner city school. So this teacher created it out of being in the classroom and then telling us what was needed and it activated this whole deal that's uh, touching our city. Wow, come on, Jimmy. That's yeah. epic. I love that. So good. Well, I might come back on something else on sure. this, Jimmy, but Teo, I want to um, I want to ask you about, you know, I've been to your church. I've been to Zion. I've seen Dunamis at work in the universities. I've been to the Dunamis gatherings on your university campuses. Uh, we experienced what happened at the Send together. Um, I wanted to ask you, like, give us give us a few thoughts on, like, this is what struck me about your church. As I looked out there, and I'm like, here's a whole bunch of young professionals. You can, you know, that's kind of the, a lot of the demographic in your church, and young adults, and yet they, this group of people, you know, are going to their careers on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. But Dunamis and Zion have had a unique ability to marry together like my career and a life of excellence with a life of walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. So, you know, I, your guys are praying for the sick at work and your guys are sharing the gospel and they believe in hearing the voice of God and, and sharing and encouraging people through hearing the voice of God. What have you done, Teo, to build a church of people that are young professionals and also have embraced kind of a naturally supernatural life. Wow, that's awesome, Andy. Well, first off, man, uh, that that phrase Jimmy just shared, I preach to the disciples and let the crowd watch. I mean, for me, that's that's a, such a key thing, right? And uh, I, I guess in a lot of that language, uh, I think I would trace it to a little bit of our behavior too as we're leading. Because, um, you know, you, you know it, it's crazy to think that the more uncomfortable and, and, and as you push people out of their comfort zone, the more engagement you get. Because I really believe that people are, are after something that's worth living and not just an easy Christianity. They're willing to take up their cross. And uh, we started seeing that. And when we started kind of getting, you know, a hint of that, we just went for it. And um, a lot of the two is from the pulpit to constantly, as we're teaching the word, um, making sure that we're breaking the secular and sacred divide. Um, I, I never realized how the business leaders in our community or the marketplace people in our community felt like they were second class kingdom citizens because they weren't preaching from the pulpit or leading worship or even having time to uh, lead a small group during the week because they're so involved with their jobs. And a lot of them, you know, just, you know, uh, uh, faithful people, but they just carried that burden of guilt of thinking, man, I'm not, you know, as spiritual as these other guys. And, and so when we start saying, you know what, you, you are an ambassador of the kingdom into the company that you're working in, in the school system where you're teaching, uh, even like uh, uh, crazy. I had a, a, a just a quick story. One of my um, 
uh, church members, <laughs> he he approached me and he said, and you actually know him. Um, his name is Shigeto. He's an Olympian judo uh, uh, athlete, uh, fought uh, or actually uh, went to the Olympics of 92 in Barcelona, 92 for Brazil, was the judo uh, captain for Brazil national team. He's Japanese, Japanese Brazilian. His name is Shigeto. And uh, Shigeto, you know, after he finished his judo career, went into uh, uh, becoming a personal trainer, ended up uh, training these top business people in the in the nation. And when he started getting, you know, this revelation, listen, your job is just the means. You're you're really on a mission here to, to to preach the gospel, make disciples, expand the kingdom. And God just gave you this amazing athletic ability, an amazing, you know, uh, resume of being an Olympian, a jujitsu black belt and, and have gone to, to, to you know uh, physical education uh, school to, to get to you know really serve people and uh, man he he said he would come every week with testimonies of how he's been praying for the sick how he's been leading people to Christ how people would just try to get actually get him to be their personal trainer because they saw that she get the one and just train them physically it would more like a counseling therapy kind of deal and he would just you know uh, put the gospel in there and so it, he's like you know what i don't need to preach i, I don't need to sing uh, I, I can just do this for the rest of my life i feel fulfilled i feel like i'm fulfilling the great commission and so I could, I mean, I could spend hours telling you these stories. Yeah. And once we start, you know, packaging uh, the gospel and, and, and saying, hey, you could do that uh, in the classroom. Like I have a congregation here Sunday morning and uh, Monday morning you're going to go into homeroom and, and that is your congregation. And, and I would just see the teachers in our congregation just light up. They're like, man, I'm ready. So, you know, we, we, we say that it's a little cliche, but it's the Monday through Friday church. And uh, they come in uh, a Sunday. I tell them Sunday is just kind of, you know, coach with the team in the locker room. But uh, we're going to go up to the playing field Monday and it's game time. And so game time is, you know, Monday through Friday. And so uh, the testimony started coming in. You know, we, we of course, uh, will highlight what God is doing. You know, it's, it's just, you know, the verse that we all know that uh, the testimony of Christ is the spirit of prophecy. So people, you know, get a hold of that verse in Revelation. They're like, wow, if Christ did it with that that uh, person, he can do it through me. So they have more boldness. They'll go out there Monday. They'll start seeing, you know, the signs following, the disciples being formed. You know, it's just kind of snowball effect. So we've yeah. just been graced by the Lord to see that happen. I love that. That's so good, Teo. Monday through Friday, church. Love it. And uh, maybe one more, one more thought on this, Teo. I just want to hear from you. Is one of the defining marks of Dunamis, which is the is the movement side, has been getting university students to move beyond fear, move beyond insecurity, and really fearlessly share the gospel. Um, again, not afraid to pray for the sick, not afraid to approach strangers and share about the love of Jesus, not afraid to invite people to discipleship and studying the Bible together. What was the key? Like, what was the? What did you find was the paradigm shift from fear? and I'm here to be in university and study and I'm I'm a believer but I'm not totally sure about how to share about it to like this movement of bold on fire radical university students yeah you know I I tell people when I was in college I had my uh, a, a spiritual uh, awakening in college but before that you know I kind of had my you know a desert spiritually speaking there as well and I tell people, you know, it's rarely that you'll see people there like they want to sin. I just kind of feel like in that age group, people are just bored. Uh, they want adrenaline. They want a cause. They want something that's passionate. And, and uh, they're super hungry for spirituality, you know. And unfortunately, you know, we uh, at times we're at fault when we don't offer them a, a, a Christianity that's uh, that's actually, you know, worth living, that costs something, that, that's full of an adventure with the Lord. And so when we uh, uh, started seeing that, you know, we're like, maybe they're a little opposed to the Christian church, but they're very open to spirituality. And, and, and we would just, you know, pray, uh, get, you know, uh, super faith filled, go out there and, and just see needs, talk to people and, and, and step out in faith. You know, we, we wow. would we were so desperate to be used by the Lord that we were willing to put our reputation on the line.
Hey, Come I am on. willing. I am willing to pray, and then nothing happens, and it's going to be super awkward, and I could be mocked. I'm willing to do that because what if something could happen? And, wow. and uh, you know, most of the time something did happen because God was so gracious, and he would honor our steps of faith. Even, you know, under young zeal, I mean, I look back, we did a lot of stuff that I would probably change today. <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, but we saw breakthrough, man. And people wow. would see, you know, the supernatural. They'd be like, whoa, I, I like that. I'm hungry for that. Something that's transcendent. What, what do I do now? And then we would say, hey, come back here next week. And then we would finally, you know, we hooked them. And now we opened the word. And then we go into the word and scriptures for discipleship. And so that was kind of like our strategy, you know. And so we would see fruit out of that. And uh, we still see it. And uh, it's just funny because, I mean, People, when, when, when they start experiencing uh, the move of the Spirit in you and through you, I mean, it's contagious. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So good, Teo. <clears throat> and I can definitely say I saw that firsthand in Brazil. It's been astounding to see uh, the move of God there. And uh, the activated believer, the average believer feels like are so active in loving the law, yes. sharing their faith, you know, living living out loud. So I, I, I can sure attest to that. And Francis, I, I want to ask you a question of, you know, many, uh, at least us on this call, we would be aware, and I'm not sure how many watching would be aware that you had a major transition moment. And some of it, at least, you can speak into this better than me, was around visiting the Chinese underground church. And can you take us into that moment of kind of, you know, having grown a remarkable church, large church, and then, you know, seeing that and experiencing that to then kind of ex what you experienced in the underground church in China. What was it that struck you in that? What did you see? Take us into kind of the moment and kind of your thought process as you were even experiencing that. Yeah, I, I mean, when I went to China, uh, my oldest daughter, Rachel, and I, you know, went to the underground churches at, and I mean, only two of us could go because they said it's, you know, kind of dangerous and we don't bring crowd, whatever. And the way these young people were praying, I mean, they were screaming these prayers like, God, take me to the most dangerous place on the earth. I will die for you. Please, please make me worthy to be a martyr in your name. You know, and they're all praying these things. And then they're sharing testimonies of persecution they went through and I just never saw a more fired up group of young people. And I, it just hit me. It's like, this is, this makes perfect sense when I read the scriptures. Like this wow. is so yeah. congruent with what I read in scripture. And I know you guys are more familiar and used to that because, you know, you work with a lot of the young people that are going to the end of the earth. But for me, it was like, I, I remember leaving there and telling my daughter, I'm like, honey, I I wish you could grow up with these people. I, I wish, wow. I, I want you to have wow. what they have. I mean, honestly, that's what I think, you know, my wife and I, when, we, when we're with you guys, um, you know, when, I, when I'm with the YWAM crew and we're, you know, when we were in, uh, what you call it, Bali and all those guys. Yeah, uh, yeah. Can we want our kids growing up with these types of people. You know, everything. I don't know you that well, Teo. We're just getting to know each other. But everything Andy tells me about the ministry. And, and every time I'm in Brazil, I'm just like blown away. Yeah. And uh, the faith, the urgency, and then going to Antioch. And everyone you meet, it's like, What's your story? Oh, I was blah, 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 blah. And then I went to, you know, whatever, India for eight years. And, it, you know, I'm like, whoa, everyone from the, the guy taking the offering to the guy showing you your seat, the guy in the parking lot. What's your story? What's your story? And so for me, it was kind of like a, a radical shift. Um, wow. I was pretty much, uh, you know, a church preacher and, you know, a church that grew and, and I would, I thought we were doing a great job. And I, I still do. I felt like, man, we gave so much to the poor. We tried to send as many people as we could. Um, but my awareness of the lost uh, world that we live in was something that just kept growing as I wow. was shepherding. Wow. Wow. That's epic. And Francis, um, I, you know, when I first started to, 
you know, I'd heard about you a little bit before that season when you were planting that church. I'd seen some, you know, some of your amazing messages on YouTube. Then kind of all of us began to hear together, like Francis is laying down, Francis Chan is laying down his big church. And we were, you know, you took your family to Asia and is Francis ever going to come back to America? And then the next thing I knew, I was hearing these stories that were so, I, for me, it was like so paradigm shifting and remarkable. I was hearing stories of like, hey, have you heard like Francis and a few guys are walking the streets of San Francisco and knocking on doors and sharing the gospel and they're seeing people get saved off the streets and they're helping them become house church pastors. Tell us a little bit of like when you made that major transition, what was in your heart where you're like from this day forward, whoever I raise up or whatever believers would gather together with me in a home or wherever is they're going to live the gospel in the Great Commission. What was going on there? What was the determination you made in your heart? And then how did you do it? Whether it was with five or 10 or 20, how did you help those people adopt that same mindset? Yeah, I, I think for me, the only goal in my mind was I, I want my life to make sense biblically. I want to feel yeah. like, gosh, yeah. this is the way Jesus and his disciples lived. They didn't go to a green room and then come out and preach a message and go back and have a few more drinks and then write a book. <laughs> wow. Like, come on. Like they, they just, they went and the spirit led him. And, and, uh, you know, when, when Jimmy shares his testimony, which brother, like, it's just, it's, it's exactly what I think should happen. You read the word. Yeah. And you go, Man, what's the word say? Whatever it says, wow. I'm just going to do, just gonna yeah. do it. And, and so when I got to San Francisco, I thought, God, just forget all the structures and paradigms of things I think mm -hmm. I have to do. Like Jesus wow. just started walking down the street mm -hmm. and God would bring people to him. Right. And so I'm just like, God, I'm just going to walk around San Francisco. I want to be as much like Christ as I can. Mm -hmm. And you set him up with those disciples. And so do the same thing with me. I'll just start sharing and you know, maybe I'll go by the water and say, hey, cast your net on the other side of your boat. <laughs> you know, I just want to do everything, you know, like <laughs> Jesus. And then, and then how did the church form? And what were those relationships like? So it was just kind of like a starting over. And man, every day, I just, I want to live like an adventure like that. I mean, wow. And, and, and that's why I feel like my life has been. Yeah, and, yeah. And there's been like these relationships that have been built and, and when I see the church in the New Testament, like they were perfectly one. They didn't care about their stuff. And they loved each other so deeply. And everyone saw it. And that's what attracted them. So I'm like, I want a church like that. I want us to be built on love. And we sacrifice. We open up our homes. We share our possessions. Like wow. everything on the table. And and so it's just been super, super fun. Not yeah. without its, its, its share of heartbreak. Sure. And, disappointment and judas's and everything else but even that is is a joy going through it all. wow wow come on awesome. well i want to ask you a question on that and jimmy jump in on and and kind of respond to what francis just said yeah. in a moment here but uh francis i i don't know the full story but i know in those early san francisco days there were a couple guys you literally met off the street invited into your home started a disciple and some of those are the guys that i now know that are these phenomenal house church pastors that are making disciples and seeing the lost saved. Could you maybe give us one of those stories of kind of what you experienced in, in that area? Yeah. I mean, I was just with one of the guys, you know, the one that has F U tattooed on his eyelids. <laughs> my favorite. He's my favorite. I love is, that guy. He's an elder now, our, our F U elder. He, uh, he is one of the godliest men on this planet. Yes. He loves Gosh. the Lord with all of his heart. Mm -hmm. And, uh, man, I had the honor of, um, you know, he got out of prison after years, you know. And, and so he came into our men's home and because I had started a ministry for, for guys coming out of prison. And, and uh, because I had another guy in my house that came out of prison and discipled him. And this was a guy he was locked up with. Um, but they had like a, he had gotten some girl pregnant from eight years ago and had like this eight year old son and, wow. and, uh, but was back with that girl and wanted to marry her. And, uh, 
proposes to her and she's like, oh, you know, this whole God thing. And, and I'm like, have her move into my house, you know, with her and her son. And uh, Lisa starts discipling her. You know, my son starts discipling his son. Um, and I got to do their marriage. And now they've had a few more kids. And, uh, wow. and now he's walking the streets and just sharing with everyone and their mother, you know, about, I mean, it's a long, long story. But here, here he's like a spiritual leader to me now. Wow. Uh, years later, now he's married. And uh, they've had a couple more kids. They named one after Lisa, one after me. Whoa! Um, yeah, come new on. Name for me, because no one wants their kid named Francis. So it's Vicente <laughs> Francis. That's <laughs> true. <laughs> That's truth, Jimmy says. Oh, no. I know. I know. It's, it's my burden to bear. But uh, I don't know. I just love these guys. Like, yeah. It's so fun to see them now shepherding, and people are taking on their DNA. I, one of you guys were saying it earlier, like it, it, Jimmy said, it, it's, it's got to be real in your life. Sure. Then your disciples aren't going to have it. And then the disciples, disciples. And, yeah. and that's what we're seeing. Like that is the key is for everyone that's listening. Like you yourself, it can't be, well, Andy said this, or Jimmy said this, or Teo said this, like, it's about you and, and your inner man, like everything inside of you. It's the Holy Spirit leading you on this adventure because you personally are in love with him. And mm. people see it. They see if you're just repeating what someone told you or if you are truly in love with him, you're ready to go to the ends of the earth for him. Your mm. disciples, they take on that DNA. Yes. And yeah. so it's so fun to see my guys Gosh. and the people they disciple going that same direction wow Ooh, come on it. that is good jimmy give us some thoughts on that and respond to francis yeah. on that <laughs> well i mean uh, that's it right and i know that Teo would have the same stories in the end the bottom line is the bible still works anybody fully surrendered to jesus still can experience everything you see in the scriptures and above and beyond if we actually just do it, right? So people are only as radical as you are. I mean, when wow. we said discipleship, wherever you want somebody to go, you got to go one step further. So if we won't be able to share the gospel, then I'm sharing the gospel everywhere mm. I go. I want people to read the word, then I'm reading the word God, one next level. They're not going to do more than you. They're going to do just a little less as it should be, right? You're the teacher, but you got to live it out. It's not just what we know, it's who we are. It, too many wow. times in the Western world, we want to change what we do. What's the latest strategy? What's the latest book? What's the latest deal? We need to change who we are, not what we do. Because wow. when we love Jesus and we surrender to his word and we start living it out, it's infectious. I, I, I was just thinking, I was reminded, Francis and I, uh, when we went into Myanmar, uh, and I just want to say, hey, YWAM guys and the whole deal pulled us into this beautiful story, which is not over in the name of Jesus. It's not over. What was not the over. It's going to become a door because the church is praying for Myanmar. If the Come church on. is praying this hour, that window that we thought was there is turning into a door in the name of Jesus if we pray. So now what you see in the news, that is not the end of this story. We are going to contend for a breakthrough in Myanmar. That was a tangent. All right, here we go. <laughs> so Francis, uh, we were going to Myanmar, and of course, because Francis is a famous Christian, we could have done the biggest churches, <laughs> the biggest deals. And uh, so I said, hey, Francis, take time out on the famous Christian thing. What if we just went <laughs> into the, into the uh, slums and just went door to door and shared the gospel? Said, how are we going to get to know Myanmar unless we get to know the people? And of course, Come on. well, I'm going to let him off the hook a little bit. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, we had our kids, we had our sons, we had a couple of friends. And we just spent days walking through the slums and going house to house, sharing the gospel, sitting on mats, praying for the sick, seeing mm -hmm. the glory of God in Buddhist mm -hmm. communities. And nobody knew who Francis Chan was, of course, nobody mm -hmm. knew who I was anyway. And but it, we were alive. Do you remember, bro? I mean, just walking mm -hmm. out that way. We're just looking at each other and said, this is life. I mean, it's not the Come stage on. is just a deal. It's it's being in the life of Jesus and seeing somebody go from darkness to light in a moment. Wow. I mean, so that's, uh, so, Hey, we're in our fifties. He is actually 50 plus. Uh, we, we are old guys now. And it's such a blast going door to door witnessing with your own sons and come on the story of 
God and not worrying wow. about Wow. I do want to say one little fun story that I know everybody's going to love. So Francis and I are with this guy, uh, uh, with this these two older ladies. I mean, they have like two teeth in their mouth. And we're putting in the time, man. We're sitting there loving them. Where are they hurting? Everywhere, you know, praying. For them. <laughs> and uh, this dude comes to, the, to, the, to this little hut, like a, a, a guy carrying propane or something. And he said, oh, wrong house. And we've engaged the guy in conversation. And we find he, he's, he's got a Catholic background. And Francis said, uh, hey, you know, uh, do, do you know that the Pope, uh, really cares about you and cares about you getting the Bible and getting the gospel. And the guy said, what are you talking about? He said, yeah, the Pope told me to tell you that, that you needed to follow Jesus in the word of God. And the guy's like, what? And he said, look, let me show you. And Francis pulls up a picture of him and the Pope. And the guy just, what? And he said, yeah, the Pope told me to come tell you that you need to follow Jesus and you need to know the word of God. And of course the guy got saved. I mean, it was glorious. The guy gets saved. We go next door to his cousin, whoever that is. And what was it? Three weeks later, the guy that works in the neighborhood baptized the guy, sent us the pictures of it. Wow. And I and so I told Francis where we went to pull that picture out, bro. <laughs> so it wasn't really fair, you know, on who wins the person to the Lord because I didn't have the Pope picture. But hey, <laughs> praise God! It, oh, it, that's crazy. Anyway, but the bottom line I is the joy that. of our lives, and I can speak for Francis on this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, loving Jesus mm-hmm. and sharing the gospel and being real with the person who nobody knows, right? Wow. It's a wow. joy. And when you lose that joy, I mean, you, you lose everything. And when you have that joy, you have everything. Wow. That's so good. Mm-hmm. I, uh, something I'm hearing all of you say that I was just reading, Francis and I are, um, and a bunch are, are really focusing in on John 13 through 17 right now. So mm-hmm. I've just been stuck in these chapters. And I was something you guys are saying that so struck me the other day was in the very um, first verse. I couldn't get past it. It says, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And I think sometimes in wow. life leadership, everybody wants a crowd. Success is the masses, the bigger, the better. But what I love and know about all three of you that maybe those that know you guys may not even know is I can, I can list the disciples that Francis has made that have actually lived in his home that have actually uh, ate meals in, at his table, that have actually um, walked like daily life with him. I know their names. I've been with them. I've seen them. And they carry his DNA. And I look at Francis and I go, he is loving them to the end. Jimmy, I know your disciples. I have met so many Jimmy disciples. And it's obvious because they're all mini Jimmys. They all like, they carry your DNA. They talk like you talk. They have your... Um, your unending joyful optimism. It's like your DNA has spread, but I've met them in Dubai. I've met them in the Arab Gulf. I've met them in, uh, in South Asia. And th- you have loved them to the end. Tao, I, I, I very well know your disciples. They're good friends of mine as well. And they carry mm. your DNA. Mm. And I've watched them rise and imp- impact and leadership, but they're they're carrying years that you've invested mm-hmm. in them. Many of the guys who are now leading Dunamis Movement were guys you led to the Lord in university mm-hmm. or that you led to the Lord in your early years as a pastor. And I think so often we blaze right past the simplicity of what Jesus did. And mm-hmm. we aim for the new slick program. We aim for the new slick you know, branding We try and figure out the new way to draw the crowd, the new way to gain influence. And all the while, Jesus loved his own who were in the world, and he loved them to the end. Mm, He made disciples. Mm, And I think that's leadership. And when I think about all three of you guys, that's what I think about. I I know, you know, Brazil, we saw stadiums filled, and that was awesome, Teo. But what I really think about who you are at the core you're a disciple maker. You're mm-hmm. raising up leaders who are going to change the world. They're going to change mm-hmm. Brazil. And so that really strikes me about all three of us. And it's something that I just wish every leader 
in the world mm -hmm. would adopt as the primary strategy for transformation. Right. Get five guys, get 10 guys, pour your life into them, mm -hmm. reproduce yourself, yeah. go low, live life together, good, bad, mm -hmm. and ugly, bring them into all of it. Raise your children together, fight for your marriages together, mm -hmm. and watch what God will do as we love each other to the end. And uh, mm -hmm. the last question I kind of want to end on, guys, a little bit of a shift from this, but same vein is all of you guys have a passion for not only the places you're living. Francis, you're in San Francisco right now. Teo uh, in, you know, Sao Paulo, Brazil, uh, Jimmy in, in uh, uh, Waco, Texas. But all of you have zeal for the nations. Francis, mm -hmm. you just lived um, all of COVID in Hong Kong mm -hmm. and would go back tomorrow if you could. Mm -hmm. um, Teo, you've been around the world and you are sending some of your best leaders to even other nations to help pioneer mm -hmm. new works. Uh, Jimmy, that's been your life work, has been helping to multiply churches in the nations. How have you guys helped those that you're leading, your churches, your communities, your home churches, to not only have a passion for what's right in front of you, but also the global perspective for the nations of the earth to carry a passion for the Great Commission on a global level? I'd love to hear. I'm going to throw that first to Jimmy. Give us some thoughts. How did you build Antioch in a way that cared not only for the neighborhood right in front of you, but you guys cared about the Arab Gulf from day one. How did you do that? Yeah. Well, of course, all these are long answers, but I'll say the short answer is, if you don't go, they won't go. If you don't pray, they won't pray. Uh, if you don't carry it and, and give your life for it, they won't. So our deal was Laura and I felt called to the nations at 20 years old. We wept at the altar and surrendered, quote unquote, to God wherever, whenever. And we started a little training school that was nine months in the in the States, three months overseas. We did that for about 10 years. But the, the whole point was we begged God. We didn't buy a house for 16 years because we wanted to be ready to go tomorrow. Wow. And wow. There, there was something about going for months at a time and coming back and reporting the word of the Lord. And we wanted to be there among the unengaged and unreached. So it pulled our people here. You can't have a divided heart. God is one, right? It's Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost. There's one pull of God for the loss of the earth, and especially for the unengaged and unreached. And if you as a local pastor in wherever context you are, if you're not carrying all of it, at least before God in prayer, giving to it and going to it, they're not going to feel, taste, and touch it. It's not, you only reproduce who you are. So I, I wish I could give you, a, a, you know, I, I got all the 10 point plans. I can send you the manual, but I don't think that's really the make or break of this deal. Wow. Wow. It's whether I stay alive. So back to my story with Francis, the reason, I mean, I've got a little deal called Bell's Palsy and it was really bad back then. Those guys were scary, wasn't I? My mouth was down here. I was limping around. <laughs> but I said, we're going to the nations because if I quit going, I'm done. I, wow. I, I can't, who cares about this little outward, outer man We've got to stay sharp and on the front line so that I can come back to Waco, Texas, declare the glory of God, contend for Myanmar, and, 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 and I've, I've felt taste and touch. John said this, what we felt, what we've tasted, what we've touched, that's mm. what we're giving you. And if come you don't on. feel it, taste it, and touch it in the spirit and in the natural, you're not going to be able to give it. Wow. That's good. That is so good, Jimmy. Boil it down to what it's really all about. Teo, give us your thoughts on this. Your church is carrying global perspective. Mm -hmm. You got to, you know, you were the catalyst to the send to, to really keep the youth movement of the nation, keep thinking about Great Commission. What, what's in your heart on this and how have you helped cultivate that? Yeah, you know, I, I'm from a nation that uh, we have Christianity as it is a huge force in Brazil because of missionaries. Wow. And uh, I can uh, talk to, you know, colleagues of mine, brothers and sisters that are in ministry, young people, and we can still trace to our, our fathers being discipled and led by led to the Lord by missionaries. So it's we see today that Brazil has momentum and, and we tell people in, in even uh, in our nation, listen, if we don't give, uh, you know, we, we break a cycle that is a God cycle. Uh, these people left their nations. Uh, to come bring us the gospel, if we want the blessing of the Lord over our nation, if we dream 
of, um, of, of, of a nation discipled, if we dream to see corruption ended, if we dream of seeing justice uh, in our society, you know, we, it, it's about us going out and, and, and giving what we know that we need. And so to a certain point, a lot of people would ask, why would you think about nations if there's so much need right next to you? And I would say, you know, the thing is, um, I just need to love what God loves. And wow, Jesus' come love on. is for the nations, right? I mean, he's wow. the desire of the nations. And so Jesus loves my neighborhood, but Jesus also loves the ends of the, of the earth. Uh, and so it's, wow. it's about Jerusalem. It's about Judea and Samaria, but it's also about the ends of the earth. So it's, it's not a binary thing. And, and so I would right. always go against any binary thinking and say it, it's, it's not either or. It's and, and, uh, and both and. And so um, I, I say... For us to develop that mentality is something that we're constantly speaking about. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm also, <laughs> YOM helps me so much because I'm always getting fresh testimonies of what God's doing yeah. in, in Myanmar or, or you know, Middle East or anywhere. I mean, uh, and then I'm bringing it in and I'm, I'm kind of squeezing it in to in, in our messages on Sundays and, and whether they like it or not. Uh, before they know it, they're having global perspective. They're seen beyond their own little, you know, belly button. And they're seen, uh, hey, we have needs, but the world has needs. And and, and, wow. uh, and the Lord, you know, he, he cries over the nations at just as much he cries over, you know, my block. And so um, I think that's, that's the thing for me. Uh, uh, it's just trying to always, you know, remind people, hey, we need to love what he loves. And we need to hate what he hates. And so wow. he hates injustice here in the corner or, you know, at, at the end of the earth. So we'll go, we'll, we'll fight for it and, and we'll take the gospel there. Man, that's good. That is so good, Tao. That line, we just, we have to love what God loves. We have to care mm -hmm. about what God cares about. Again, makes it so simple, but so authentic. Um, Francis, you just spent the last year in Hong Kong. And I know if you really had it your way, still be there or headed back shortly. And, you know, kind of the visa situation is making that tough right now, but you are burning for the nations. Give us your, you know, what happened in your own heart where you carried a burden for America, but then, you know, really began to carry it for the nations. And, you know, what, what happened in that process that has, has made you so passionate about the places that have had very little gospel exposure? Yeah, I think it's what Jimmy was saying. Like when we were out there just going from hut to hut in Myanmar, I'm just going, I, you know, and, and when I was with you, Andy, you know, in, in that little village and just all that we experienced there, every day I was going, I just want to do this every day. You know, mm -hmm. like like when Jimmy and I were walking to those huts, we're like, is it like more exciting every hut we go to and we share the testimony <laughs> again, the gospel again, we're more excited and so moving to Asia was just, okay, let me use Hong Kong as a hub because I'm going to go to Myanmar. I want to go to these unre because it makes me so happy to tell people about Jesus who have never heard wow. about him. It's, it's, wow. it, yeah. it was the joy of how happy we were over there. <laughs> like we just didn't want to leave. And so then I'm telling my wife on the way home, like, why do we have to leave? Let's move over there. Let's just wow. spend our lives doing that. Now, unfortunately, it didn't work out. Once we got to Hong Kong, we weren't allowed to go anywhere because of COVID and everything else, but had a wonderful time there. And the Lord has me back in the States now for some reason. And I totally trust his sovereignty. But the desire, like, it's just so exhilarating. Um, wow. That night, that one village where you go, no one here has heard the gospel. Right. Yeah, for the first time, and I get to say it out of these lips. Yeah, oh my gosh, it was such a thrill. Like, yeah, I, I, that might have been like best night of my life. I, wow. I mean, I, I'm trying not to exaggerate, wow. but I go, yeah, wow, I got to speak to a whole village who had never heard of Jesus through a translator that is crazy and then the miracles and the yeah yeah you know the acceptance of the gospel yeah you just go i'm addicted to this uh, it was I, I, yes I, yeah gosh so, no that's good know. like we've been saying all along when that's in your heart and people yeah. see 
It's not just, it is suffering. There are times when, and many have given their lives and it, it wasn't a glorious story. And not yeah. until heaven yeah. when we see the joy of it. But I hope what you guys are hearing is, man, we are having an amazing time on this earth. Yes. On mission. And I yeah. guarantee it's more exciting than, you know, what, what the other things you'll see on Instagram that are blowing. <laughs> Come on. Right Come on. I mean, yes. Here, like the best. <laughs> And I'm going, I don't know. I, I don't know. Uh, wow. Sharing the wow. gospel in this village and then, you know, beating Jimmy and bowling afterwards. Oh. It doesn't get much better. I'm bringing a scorecard to the that, next Instagram. That is so uh, good. Just that to... is so good. Well, guys, this is so good. I know that most of you need to get rolling. And I just want to say to everyone watching, I mean, this has really been one very simple message. This is really about living like Jesus, simple obedience to the scripture. And we just say to every young person watching, like you have permission, don't let anything hold you back. Jesus is the standard. The scriptures are the invitation. And to leaders, we just say to every leader, who are you discipling? Who are the people you're reproducing yourself in? If everyone would simply make disciples, we would see spiritual awakening almost overnight with the amount of responsibility that would be taken, disciples who would be made, activation that would occur. And we believe on this call, the four of us, that um, some of the, the difficulty we're facing right now could actually turn into one of, great, one of the greatest harvests in the history of America. Yes. Come on. Um, missions movements out of nations like Brazil, that we're Come on the on. verge of a global harvest if the church will rise into this opportunity yeah. with great activation, great hope, and great courage. And I just want to yes. say we've we're launched this Take Action campaign as the SEND. Go to the SEND.org. You can see specific ways to take action right now in foster care in the global orphan crisis, in, uh, in being trained and equipped as an evangelist, lots of different opportunities, missions opportunities. Check out the Take Action campaign at the send.org. But ultimately, at the end of the day, we're done with this call. We go on with our lives. We've got to live the Great Commission. We have the great privilege today to be Jesus to someone around us, to live activated, full of courage, full of love. And I'm just so grateful, guys. Jimmy, Francis Teo for modeling that, for um, living it, and uh, for the things you guys shared today. This is so encouraging. So, Holy Spirit, we just want to pray for every person watching or that will watch this later. God, put a seed of courage in our hearts today. Activate us beyond every ounce of fear, every excuse, and everything that would hold us back. God, help us to love what you love. Jesus, help us to live like you lived. I just pray that all the complexities would be stripped away, and we would live our lives of simple obedience, loving the people in front of us. God, give us the grace to reproduce ourselves and disciples, Lord, to truly live that intentionally, to live for eternity, to live for what really matters, God. And we believe this is an hour that the church could rise glorious, could rise activated to see the gospel spread across the earth like never before in history. We love you, Jesus, with all of our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Love you, Andy. You're here. Love you guys. Love you guys. Thank you guys. Have an amazing day. All right. Have a good one. All right. Take care, everybody. Bye. Bye.